Hello, uh, my name is Dmitry Chumachenko, and uh, I'm glad to uh, come back with our social educational project, School of IT Professionals Profit, under uh, National Airspace University Kharkiv Aviation Institute. And it's a big honor for me uh, to introduce you Stuart Russell, AI legend, and uh, we are going to talk today about uh, autonomous lethal weapons. Uh, Professor Russell, I wouldn't waste uh, our time, so the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I'm going to give pretty much the same talk that I usually give um, on this topic. Um, but I hope that, I imagine that your questions will be very different given the situation that Ukraine faces right now. Um, and I'm happy to answer those questions to the best of my ability. So let me bring up, uh, assuming I can find it. Um, okay, sorry. There we go. Is that one? Okay, so I hope good, you can see the slides. Um, all right, so let's get into talking about uh, artificial intelligence and its roles in military affairs. Um, so AI has been uh, under development for 70 years or so, and um, over that time, people have found many ways to use AI technology uh, in military affairs. So some of the first methods were for interpreting data. So I call these perceptual. Um, and that included uh, the use of AI for intelligence analysis. In fact, the first research projects on natural language understanding were developed in the US for the purpose of translating Russian uh, scientific documents into English. Um, and uh, the use of AI in intelligence analysis uh, includes uh, satellite data. Um, it's been estimated that if you had human beings looking at all the satellite data uh, that is generated currently, you would need about 30 million people working 24 hours a day uh, just to look at the satellite images that that are collected every day. Um, so you have to use AI methods to find what's important and interesting uh, in satellite data. And we really are moving in that area towards global scale monitoring. So 10 years ago, people talked about country scale monitoring where they could look at, for example, Iran uh, and, and try to analyze all the physical activity happening in Iran to see if new uh, nuclear weapons facilities were being developed underground, for example. Um, and now we can do this on a global scale. Uh, in, in more traditional military situation assessment, um, AI is used to merge data from human intelligence, from satellites, from battlefield uh, data that's collected um, and uh, to, to give a common operating picture to military officers um, and also to detect threats to uh, you know, potential uh, attacks, um, forces massing on the borders of countries uh, and so on. Um, AI has been used in reconnaissance, uh, typically uh, aerial reconnaissance uh, and in target recognition, both um, on board missiles uh, and um, and now in tanks uh, and in human piloted drones. In fact, much of the funding for computer vision research in the US came from the ATR, the Automated Target Recognition Program, which was funded by the Defense Department for about 20 or 25 years. So that's the perceptual side. And then on the operational side, uh, which is about military decision-making and active military activities, 
Um, AI has been used in simulators uh, to represent uh, simulated forces in training. Uh, in training. Uh, it's also been used for logistical support. So in um, Operation Desert Storm, uh, which is the first Gulf War, um, when uh, the US pushed uh, the Iraqis out of Kuwait, um, AI systems were used to generate and validate the logistical plans for moving 500,000 US troops and equipment uh, from the United States to the Middle East. Um, and uh, I have seen arguments to the effect that the, that one application of AI saved more money than all of the AI research and development funding that the federal government has spent uh, since the beginning of time. Um, so that was a very successful application of AI uh, in a large scale military operation. Um, I think one important area that's gradually evolving, I would say it's still a little slower than most people expect is strategic and tactical planning. So actually developing the, uh, the high level campaign plans and the low level tactical plans down to the level of the movement of individual units, um, that is still uh, almost entirely manual, although we use computer tools to manage the, the data, to manage the plans. But in terms of developing and uh, inventing new uh, types of military campaign, um, that's still uh, in the very early stages. If it can be um, successful, if we can use AI to create completely new ways of fighting war, uh, that would in itself be revolutionary um, and might uh, completely upset the strategic balance in various parts of the world. Um, so there's also AI in cyber operations, AI in psychological operations, but what I'm gonna talk mostly about is AI in weapons themselves. Um, and so the last topic, semi-autonomous and autonomous weapons will be my subject today. So autonomous weapons, the, the, um, the standard definition is weapons that can locate, select and eliminate human targets without human intervention. Um, so if we think about what already exists, so landmines uh, to some extent satisfy that criterion. They can't actually locate human targets, but they can in simple ways choose between uh, targets based on uh, the amount of metal they contain and the, uh, the amount of weight uh, with which the target presses on top of the landmine. Um, and those, because they are too stupid, um, they are mostly banned because they are indiscriminate and they kill very large numbers of civilians. Um, so most countries have signed the landmine treaty um, and have destroyed their stocks of landmines. And then more recently, uh, we have the, um, the Samsung Sentry robot, which is at the top in the center. Uh, so this is a stationary defensive robot deployed in the demilitarized zone between South and North Korea. Um, and it has an autonomous mode in which it will identify uh, humans who move into its field of view uh, and kill them using uh, machine guns uh, as, as the weapon. Um, the Israeli Harap missile, which is the top right, uh, is what's called a kamikaze missile. It carries about a 25 kilogram warhead. Uh, and when it detects a target that satisfies some targeting criterion, it will dive bomb and destroy the target. And it can rove over a geographical area, a fairly wide area for up to six hours looking for a target. And the target could be based on um, a radiation signature such as the radar from uh, an anti-aircraft battery, or it could be based on a visual image. So it actually has a camera. Um, and if it finds a target that meets a visual criterion, such as looks like a tank, uh, then it will uh, dive bomb and destroy it. Uh, 
so the harpy or the harrop has been around for about uh, a decade. Um, much more recent is the cargo drone, uh, which is that thing that sort of looks like a large insect. Um, and uh, so this is about uh, 40 centimeters uh, in diameter. And um, when it was released in late 2017, uh, it was advertised as capable of autonomous hits uh, of anti-personnel operations, of tracking moving targets, using face recognition, uh, and so on. So this really qualifies as the, uh, the sort of archetypal lethal autonomous weapon. Um, more recently, uh, Chinese company Xi'an has developed the Blowfish uh, helicopter gunship, which is sh shown uh, at the bottom right, uh, which carries uh, an onboard machine gun uh, but it can also drop bombs uh, as well. So these are just some examples of autonomous weapons that are on the market right now. Um, and there's lots more under development. So every type of weapon you can think of, fighter aircraft, submarines, um, small boats, large destroyers, uh, tanks, um, small um, fixed wing aircraft uh, and uh, small rotorcraft or sometimes typically quadcopters or hexacopters um, that uh, can operate uh, autonomously. So all of these are under development, um, but as far as I know, none of these examples beyond the ones that I showed you are currently available for use on the battlefield. Um, I do want to make one distinction between the word drone um, and uh, what's sometimes called the UAV, the uncrewed air vehicle, um, or the AAV, the autonomous air vehicle. So drone is an ambiguous term. Um, and in the United States, it usually means a remotely piloted uh, air vehicle uh, that has onboard weapons. Um, so this would be the Reaper, the Predator, and so on. Um, other people use drone as synonymous with a, an airborne lethal autonomous weapon. Um, but uh, when I want to talk about these things, I will call them AAVs if they're autonomous. Um, and many other things that people call drones are, are even as simple as a cruise missile, which, which targets a particular uh, location with not necessarily any sophisticated onboard sensing or decision making. Okay, so I'll just briefly go through some of the component technologies that, that would go towards a fully autonomous weapon. Uh, so first of all, you need low level motor control. The, the, the weapon has to be able to move uh, successfully, whether it's on the ground or in the air. Um, so I'll show you a couple of examples. This is, uh, this is the big dog robot, um, which is a fairly large uh, robot that would be able to carry weapons or also carry casualties, soldiers who've been wounded, uh, evacuate them from the battlefield. But you can see that it's extremely mobile uh, and is able to uh, operate in much the same way as uh, a mule or uh, other uh, load carrying pack animal. Um, this is uh, some examples of uh, fully autonomous uh, quadcopters, um, particularly in this case, carrying a payload and, and taking that payload through a hoop. Um, and so this is actually something that is created by a machine learning process. So this gives you an example of the kind of thing that these systems are able to do. Uh, and then navigation, of course, we're already familiar with this with um, with self-driving cars and, and you can buy chips that facilitate uh, successful navigation in complex environments. So this is a short video from if it's going to play, it looks like it's not going to play. Oh well. Okay, there it goes. Right. So this is just video taken by the self-driving car showing some of the, the difficult uh, circumstances visually and otherwise that it's able to cope with successfully. And at least in San Francisco, which is near where I live, 
Um, these, these kinds of vehicles are fairly widespread. Um, and I would say that the job of building a self-driving car is actually much more difficult than the job of building a fully autonomous weapon. Navigate web. environments with obstacles. Here showing a coordinated activity from multiple uh, autonomous quadcopters, and how they can infiltrate a building very easily. Um, they can, once they're inside a building, they can then even explore and build a map of that building. Um, so I apologize for this. So you can see in the bottom right, the drone approaching the building. I keep calling it a drone. It's the quadcopter going inside the building uh, and then going up the stairs. And on the left, you see the map of the building that the, the algorithm is constructing uh, as the quadcopter is flying around. Uh, so the system has to be able to recognize targets and recognize threats, so it avoids those threats or, or counters those threats. Um, and uh, it can, for example, recognize humans, um, it can recognize objects, and already the technology for doing this is uh, as reliable as human beings. And then you have to be able to attack. Right, you actually have to be able to kill the target. Um, and uh, there's a lot of methods, both uh, with uh, onboard machine guns, with dropping bombs or, or hand grenades, um, or with dive bombing the, the kamikaze weapon. Um, and then you have to be able to, um, so those are sort of the, the basic things. The last thing is, is the decision making uh, about where to go. Uh, if you have many weapons, how they coordinate uh, to carry out a large-scale attack, and so on. And here, uh, we've been developing AI systems for these capabilities for many years, mainly in uh, video game AI, but also in the logistics example. So I'll just show you a short video of uh, a set of quadcopters that are cooperating to actually build the building. So this is a non-destructive use of, uh, of quadcopters. So all of these capabilities are out there. They've been around for several years. Some of those videos that I showed you are um, 15 years old. Uh, so none of the technology that we're talking about is science fiction. It's all real and available and usable. Next thing I wanna talk about is what is legal. Um, and the legality of weapons is guided by what's called international humanitarian law or IHL. Uh, this is what we think of as the Geneva Conventions and, uh, and various other treaties uh, that nations have agreed to over the years. Um, so when we talk about weapon systems, uh, it has to be possible to, uh, to use the weapon in a way that successfully discriminates between combatants or soldiers and civilians, non-combatants. Uh, you have to be able to judge that the attack is necessary from a military point of view. Um, so for example, it's illegal to attack uh, combatants who are surrendering or retreating and pose no threat uh, to your forces. And uh, you have to be able to judge proportionality. So you're allowed to cause collateral damage and you're actually allowed to kill civilians uh, as a side effect of a military attack, as long as the military target is a sufficient value and importance. Um, so to satisfy all those requirements, an AI system would have to be very sophisticated. I think discrimination is possible for an autonomous weapon with current technology, but to judge necessity and proportionality, you require an understanding of the broader military situation. And this is not possible for current AI systems. So that means that for an attack to be legal using autonomous weapons, the mission of those weapons has to be restricted in such a way that the human, the human who is launching the attack can ensure that no matter what happens, the attack will be militarily necessary and the damage will be proportional. So that means the proportional to the value of the target. So that means that the types of missions that current AI systems could carry out legally 
are very restricted uh, because of the risk of violating uh, necessity and proportionality. Okay, so, so I've given you some background on the use of AI, on the types of technology that uh, exists already, the types of weapons that are already on the market, um, and then what are the legal constraints on that. So since um, around 2013, there has been international discussion on whether or not uh, fully autonomous weapons should be legal, and if they are legal, what constraints should we operate under? Uh, in 2013, Christoph Haynes issued a report, and the main concern that was raised by that report was the possibility of accidental violation of the laws of war. Uh, in particular, uh, the possible inability of AI systems to discriminate between civilians and soldiers. Um, and I learned about this report. Um, I received an email from an organization called Human Rights Watch, uh, which has been concerned for, for quite a few decades about violations of the laws of war, uh, in particular by human soldiers. Um, and, uh, and now the question is, uh, will robots be better or worse than human soldiers? Um, and this report suggests that uh, at least in 2013, they were worse than human soldiers. They would be less able to discriminate between civilians and soldiers. Um, I actually think, as, as will become clear, that that probably isn't the main issue. Um, and it caused negotiations about autonomous weapons to uh, actually be focused on what I think are not the right set of questions. So the first uh, international discussions uh, took place in 2014 in Geneva at uh, an organization called CCW, which stands for Certain Conventional Weapons, uh, which is short for basically the Geneva Conventions on, uh, you know, the, on cer certain conventional weapons that may be uh, unduly injurious or blah, blah, blah. It's a very long name, uh, and we just call it CCW for short, but that's where they discuss weapon systems other than nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, but other types of conventional weapons and how they should be regulated. Um, so in 2015, the AI community got together and wrote uh, an open letter which was signed by more than, in the end, more than 30,000 people. Um, it generated a huge amount of publicity. There were several thousand newspaper articles in more than 50 countries. Um, and the letter was pretty unambiguous that the AI community is opposed to the use of AI to kill people um, in, in the form of lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, not opposed to other military applications of AI, but specifically opposed to lethal autonomous weapons. And the primary reason um, that we gave was that uh, lethal autonomous weapons would become weapons of mass destruction. So I'll, I will explain that point uh, in the succeeding slides. Um, in 2016, the CCW moved from informal to formal discussions, meaning that uh, government experts were designated by all the member states to actually begin negotiating the language of a potential treaty. So that was seven years ago, and they are still discussing the language of a potential treaty, uh, and there has been very little progress since then. Um, so by 2018, there were 26 uh, countries who had uh, explicitly stated they would support a total ban on lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, that included several European countries. It included China, um, as well as the non-aligned movement, uh, which uh, at least purportedly represents another 77 countries. Uh, the European Parliament voted for a total ban on autonomous weapons. And uh, the United Nations Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, also uh, issued a statement that um, these weapons should be banned. Uh, so by 2019, 
Uh, most of the nations at CCW were pushing for negotiations on a treaty. There were just those uh, six countries opposed, Australia, Israel, Russia, United States, South Korea, and the United Kingdom. So of those six countries, um, Australia has gone backwards and forwards. Uh, South Korea has gone backwards and forwards. United Kingdom is not sure. But Israel, Russia, and the United States are still explicitly opposed to a treaty. And I think this is the only thing that Russia, the United States, and Israel agree on, uh, is that they, want, they all want to move ahead with uh, lethal autonomous weapons. So the CCW requires unanimous agreement from the, mental, from the member states which means that it's more likely that there will be progress in the United Nations General Assembly, which does not require unanimous agreement. Um, it's also worth mentioning that some corporations, uh, Google representing the tech industry uh, has announced that they will not work on autonomous weapons, but also BAE Systems, uh, which used to be known as British Aerospace, which is the second largest Western defense manufacturer company, company um, they have announced that they are opposed to fully autonomous weapons. Uh, and more, more recent developments, um, we saw in 2020 uh, a report on the use of the Kagu drone, the one that I showed you earlier, uh, in the conflict in Libya, despite there being a total arms embargo on Libya during that period. Um, we saw in 2022 a declaration in the United States General, uh, sorry, United Nations General Assembly, uh, led by Austria uh, and signed by about 70 countries, including the United States and China. Um, and this declaration includes the possibility that uh, regulations might be needed beyond those already contained in international humanitarian law. So it's not a, a state direct statement supporting a treaty to ban autonomous weapons, but it's a step in action. So then um, things are actually moving quite quickly. In February uh, of this year, there was a conference on, um, on the responsible use of AI in military affairs, the REAIM conference in The Hague. Uh, during that conference, the United States uh, announced a new political declaration, which is, is not supporting a treaty, but it's supporting a voluntary code of conduct for what they call responsible use of AI in weapons. Um, and one important part about that, which I probably should have written on the slide because it's really important, is that the United States for the first time declared uh, that they would not use AI in the launch chain for nuclear weapons. Now, you might think that's kind of obvious, right? That you would never want to hand over nuclear weapons to a robot uh, to launch. Um, but that remains a legal possibility. Uh, and this was the first time that a, a nuclear state had uh, said that they would not use AI for launching nuclear weapons. So it's possible that um, we might achieve international agreement on at least that point. Um, and then later in February uh, in Costa Rica, there was a declaration from Latin American and Caribbean countries, which did support the need for a treaty to ban at least certain types of fully autonomous weapons. So that was a big step forward. Um, there's, I think, 36 countries altogether uh, made that declaration. So, so that's, it looks like progress, but there is still a huge amount of confusion among the member states who are talking about this in Geneva. Uh, so here's one example from Germany, which you would think is a very technologically sophisticated country um, with a very sensible government. Uh, but German, Germany's foreign ministry announced a few years ago that having the ability to learn and develop self-awareness constitutes an indispensable attribute to be used to define individual functions or weapon systems as autonomous, um, which makes no sense whatsoever uh, because 
AI systems don't have self-awareness, and we also have no way of finding out if they do. Um, and so this is a completely meaningless and embarrassing statement to come from the German foreign ministry. Uh, the United Kingdom actually has a policy, a stated policy, that the United Kingdom will never uh, develop or deploy fully autonomous weapons, um, but they keep changing the definition of what they mean by autonomous weapons. Uh, and most recently, instead of what I just gave you before, weapons that can locate, select, and attack human targets, um, they now say that it's only autonomous if it understands higher level intent and direction. Uh, which again is a very vague uh, property. And they say autonomous systems are not yet in existence and are not likely to be for many years, if at all. Um, and I think the purpose of this definition is simply to move the goalposts so that whatever weapon system they want to build, they'll just declare that it's not autonomous by changing the definition of autonomy. But in fact, this notion of autonomy is a very, very simple concept. So think about how we build uh, programs that play chess. So a human being writes the program <clears throat> and then uh, the robot operates the program and the human being says to the robot, win the game. And the robot thinks about the chess position, does a whole lot of calculation uh, and then comes up with the move. Um, and the robot is the one that decides where to move the pieces, which enemy pieces to kill uh, and so if, if the chessboard was the battlefield, then this robot would satisfy the definition of a fully autonomous weapon because it is locating, selecting, and attacking the targets. Um, and so the kind of autonomy that we are concerned about in lethal autonomous weapons is exactly the same kind of autonomy that a chess program has because its decisions although they're of course programmed by humans because all software is programmed by humans, um, its decisions are not made by humans because they are not in the position, they are not in the battlefield. They do not see the situation on the board or on the battlefield um, and, and they do not make the decision. Uh, the algorithm makes the decision to kill. Uh, so this is just a quotation I wanted to show you uh, this a uh, tweet from Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Autonomous machines with the power and discretion to select targets and take lives without human involvement are politically unacceptable, morally repugnant, which is significant um, because there are other clauses in international law that talk about uh, the dictates of public conscience, for example, uh, and they should be prohibited by international law. So it's quite rare for the Secretary General to take sides in a debate uh, about policy in the United Nations. So I, I made the claim earlier on that compliance with international humanitarian law is not necessarily the most important question. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of things that are not about, um, law, about the law of armed conflict. Um, but are about strategic considerations. Is it a good idea to have lethal autonomous weapons? So one characteristic of autonomous weapons is that their performance, how well they perform on the battlefield, is not just a function of their hardware. It's not just a function of the speed of their engines, the size of the bombs, but it's a function of the software as well, which means that uh, because software can be updated instantaneously, whereas hardware takes, you know, a decade to design and develop and manufacture and deploy at scale. Um, software can be updated instantaneously so that uh, the strategic balance, which countries are very concerned about, making sure that their armed forces are in balance with that, those of their enemies so that there's no incentive for one side to attack the other. Um, that strategic balance can change instantaneously when you can, you know, double the performance of your weapon systems by changing the software. You also have this problem that um, weapons that are controlled by software can be uh, infiltrated by software, 
Um, and therefore, if you have a significant part of your defense posture based on autonomous weapons, you can't have sufficient confidence that those weapons will actually perform as intended uh, because they may have been infiltrated. Uh, and that can cause uh, a great deal of instability in, again, instability in the strategic balance. Uh, another possibility is that uh, weapons, weapon systems could misunderstand the movements of, uh, of assets by uh, the other side, and they could perceive an attack even when an attack is not happening. Uh, and this has happened several times in, uh, in the history of uh, nuclear war, um, where there's been an incorrect detection of uh, a missile attack, um, both missile attacks on the United States and missile attacks on the Soviet Union were uh, incorrectly detected. And uh, it was only through human intervention that we prevented a full-scale nuclear war. With AI systems, there would be no human intervention, and you could get a rapid accidental escalation uh, because once there's one mistake, then there's a real response, and then there's a real response to the real response, and that, that can escalate very, very fast with no humans in the loop. But the thing I want to talk about most today is this issue that fully autonomous weapons can operate as uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, in fact, I call them scalable weapons of mass destruction. Scale. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that scalable weapons of mass destruction, because um, you can basically, once they're fully autonomous, because you don't need a human to operate them, you can launch as many as you want. You can launch 10, 100, 1,000, 100,000, million, and so on. So you can have very large swarms of autonomous weapons that can kill very large numbers of people. And just to give you a sense of that, one container that you know fits on the back of a truck uh, can fit about 1 million lethal autonomous weapons um, of a kind that I'll show you in a second. Um, and the technology to build this type of weapon already exists. Um, so the, uh, you know, just commercial products like the Skydio uh, is an autonomous air vehicle. It's a quadcopter that uh, is able to follow people around, whether they're riding a bicycle or surfing on the ocean. Uh, the quadcopter can follow you around and make movies of whatever it is you are doing. Um, that technology is very similar to what you would need to build an autonomous weapon. Uh, and I already mentioned the self-driving car uh, is probably more difficult technologically than the autonomous weapon. Um, and the, the example that I'm going to show you in the movie is a fictional example it's called a slaughter bot, um, so a robot that can slaughter people. Um, so although it's fictional, the Swiss Defense Department, after they saw the movie, actually made uh, a copy of the weapon um, to assess whether you could build uh, such a thing, whether it would be lethal. Uh, they tested it on simulated humans um, and, uh, and showed that, in fact, yeah, with with even a very small explosive, you can deliver a lethal charge uh, to the to the uh, simulated human being. Um, not only are these weapons capable of killing millions of people, um, but they can be highly selective. So you can kill, for example, only males between the age of 12 and 60. Uh, only people of a certain ethnic group, only people of a certain religious group. Um, they leave the infrastructure undamaged. So instead of a smoking ruin with a huge radioactive crater, uh, you have a perfectly functioning city. You've just got rid of all the people that you want to get rid of. Um, and they're very easy to turn into a commodity. So nuclear weapons will probably never be a commodity. They're very expensive to build. They require uh, enormous and very specialized manufacturing equipment, um, supplies of uranium, et cetera. Uh, whereas these types of weapons, you know, are no more difficult to build than, uh, you know, some of these, uh, essentially these toys um, that already have autonomous capability. So you can manufacture them in large quantities. They will be traded uh, 
in large quantities on the arms markets of the world. So in that sense, um, it will be analogous to selling nuclear weapons in supermarkets, right? There's the reason we don't sell nuclear weapons in supermarkets is not compliance with international humanitarian law, it's common sense, right? It would completely eliminate the physical, physical security of everybody on earth uh, and would probably lead to um, uncontained nuclear war if we were to do that. Um, so selling nuclear weapons in supermarkets is a really bad idea um, and creating and selling these types of weapons is also a really bad idea. Skill. So now I'm going to show you a little piece of a movie just to illustrate this, uh, this idea. React a hundred times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Trained as a team, they can penetrate buildings, cars, trains, evade people, bullets, pretty much any countermeasure. They cannot be stopped. Now, I said this was big. Why? Because we are thinking big. Watch. A $25 million order now buys this. Enough to kill half a city, the bad half. Nuclear is obsolete. Take out your entire enemy, virtually risk-free. So that gives you some, uh, some idea of, of the kinds of problems that we might face if we move ahead uh, with the development of fully autonomous weapons. Um, I think I've uh, yeah I should, I've already done this so I'm going to skip over that one. Um, okay, so there are there are some counter arguments that people make um, in favor of autonomous weapons, um, and I'll just go through some of those counter arguments to save time. So you, you can think of other arguments if you want, but uh, um, I don't think we need to bring up these particular counter arguments. So so one argument that's often given in the United States is that we have no choice. We have to do this in order to maintain uh, US technological and military dominance. Um, and uh, I think that's probably a misunderstanding of the current technology situation. Uh, this is not high technology. In fact, the US doesn't even have a lead in the technology of autonomous quadcopters, for example. Um, DJI from China has uh, more than 70% of the global, global market for um, the kind of mid-sized uh, quadcopters that um, are being used uh, in remotely piloted mode, I should say, uh, in Ukraine, for example. Um, and there are no significant US manufacturers in this sector. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think if you end up uh, having your defensive capabilities based on autonomous weapons, you are opening yourself up to serious vulnerabilities in terms of strategic instability and cyber infiltration. Another argument that you hear is that, well, we can't prevent the proliferation of autonomous weapons, so we have to develop them ourselves. Uh, there's nothing we can do in terms of controlling their international uh, proliferation. And I think this simply is uh, a very unnecessarily pessimistic argument. There have been many other military treaties um, stretching back more than 150 years 
that have been very successful uh, in preventing uh, certain categories of weapons. So BWC is the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, which has been successful. There have been uh, very few confirmed deaths from biological weapons uh, since the Second World War. And um, I, almost all of those happened as a result of clandestine biological weapons development uh, and people killed citizens of their own country uh, with biological weapons by accident. Um, the Chemical Weapons Convention actually is probably even more successful, um, partly because it has a very stringent verification regime. So countries who, are, who sign the um, Chemical Weapons Convention uh, have to implement national legislation that basically monitors all of the chemicals that could be used as uh, either as weapons or as precursors to weapons. Um, and so all the chemical manufacturers have to keep track of those products. They have to know who they're selling it to, uh, why that entity is buying them and what they're gonna use those chemicals for. Um, and this has been pretty successful uh, in uh, making it impossible even for countries that are not signatories to the convention have been having have found it very difficult to obtain uh, the necessary chemicals to build weapons. And so, for example, you see Syria using uh, some homemade uh, weapons, but also using uh, much, much simpler and less lethal chemicals like chlorine um, simply as a terror weapon uh, because they can't uh, build very sophisticated um, and highly lethal chemical weapons. It's also worth pointing out that if you're afraid of other countries having autonomous weapons, the treaty does not ban the development of anti-robot weapons. Uh, and in fact, this is an important area of military research right now. Another argument that I've heard is that um, we don't need to worry about proliferation of these weapons, that governments are very good at keeping large numbers of military grade weapons out of the hands of terrorists. Um, you probably know that that's not true. Uh, just one example, uh, in Iraq, uh, the, U the US lost track of 110,000 AK-47s um, that it was providing to what they thought of as friendly forces. And uh, pretty soon those had disappeared into the hands of lots of different militias. Um, and also it's worth mentioning that uh, it isn't just terrorists who use weapons in ways that violate uh, humanitarian norms. In fact, many countries, uh, including Russia in the present conflict, uh, are violating humanitarian norms. Um, and, and that's happened, happened in the Second World War, it happened in the Vietnam War, uh, and it's happening now. These are not just uh, irregular terrorists, but they are nation states uh, that, are, that use weapons in ways that are completely illegitimate. Uh, another argument is that, um, that these kinds of uh, small anti-personnel weapons can easily be counted, um, and so we don't need to worry about them. Um, but in fact, uh, the US has been working on countermeasures against drone swarms for more than 20 years, um, and uh, although most of these programs are classified, uh, the reports that I read suggest that there is no single technology that is effective against a large-scale drone swarm. It's just too difficult uh, to, uh, uh, to kill you know, tens of thousands of devices uh, that are moving at high speed and taking evasive maneuvers. An argument that I heard when I went to the White House to present this case is that our government would never build that type of weapon, um, this, this uh, mass uh, anti-personnel drone swarm. Um, but in that case, why would you not agree to ban those weapons, right? Why? Because by not banning the weapons, you're simply allowing other countries to make them. 
right? Even if you won't make them yourself, by not banning them, you allow other countries to make them and use them against you. So I have a difficult time understanding the position of the United Kingdom and the United States, both of which have said that they will not develop these types of weapons, um, but they also will not agree to ban these types of weapons, which is a nonsensical position. Uh, and then finally, uh, an argument uh, that you often hear um, is that we can't ban these types of autonomous weapons because that would slow down progress in civilian AI research. Um, and I'm a civilian AI researcher. I have been for 40 years. And um, I am not the least bit worried uh, that banning autonomous weapons is going to affect my research in any way, shape, or form. There is very little about um, lethal autonomous weapons uh, that is specific to weapons, um, except for the weapon itself. And basically, the fact that the AI system is connected to something that can kill people is the problem. Uh, and simply banning that connection is not going to have any effect on uh, AI itself. And you can see this in biology, for example, as a ban on biological weapons, but biology is still continuing as a ban on chemical weapons, but chemistry is still continuing. So I think this argument is uh, completely fallacious, but I hear it all the time. I think it's also worth mentioning that right now, a lot of AI researchers will not work on military applications of AI. And it's not because they are unpatriotic or that they just pacifists. Um, it's because they do not want their work to be used in lethal autonomous weapons. Um, just as chemists do not want their work to be used in chemical weapons. And by agreeing to ban lethal autonomous weapons, uh, that makes it more possible for AI researchers to work on defense applications. Um, just as uh, chemists work on military applications, uh, and so do biologists, because they know that their work is not going to be used uh, in chemical or biological weapons. Uh, so a final point, uh, as I mentioned, the United States is talking a lot about responsible use um, and asking for a voluntary code of conduct that would apply to so-called, you know, the civilized nations. Um, and I feel that this is uh, probably going to be completely ineffective um, because it doesn't put any constraints on the types of weapons that are developed, including uh, drone swarms that would become weapons of mass destruction. Um, and as we know, even responsible users under the pressure of war become uh, irresponsible. As we saw, if we think of uh, we think of the Allied forces in World War II, um, they certainly thought of themselves as responsible, but they ended up firebombing Dresden and Tokyo and using nuclear weapons against civilian cities, um, things that we would now consider to be irresponsible. Um, and uh, so in conclusion, I think we need a treaty to ban at least the anti-personnel autonomous weapon systems, um, because those are the ones that can be scaled up uh, into weapons of mass destruction. Um, and interestingly, there is a precedent for treaty that bans small weapons, but not big weapons. Uh, that's called the St. Petersburg Declaration of 1868. Um, and that declaration bans uh, basically bans exploding bullets. So it requires that any explosive uh, ordnance, uh, which could be a bullet or a shell or a missile, uh, must have at least 400 grams of explosive. Um, and they did that because they felt that exploding bullets were unnecessary, right? If you're going to shoot somebody with a bullet, if you hit them with a the bullet, they're already going to be wounded and unable to participate in combat. Um, and so exploding them as well is militarily unnecessary and also would produce horrendous wounds. Um, and so they decided to ban small explosive uh, shells and bullets. And that 
ban is pretty much still in place. There are a few types of weapons that, that violate it, like um, certain types of grenade launchers are, are less than 400 grams. Um, but by and large, this has been an effective uh, agreement for um, more than 150 years. So there are plenty of precedents for having this type of regulation. And then the other part is how do we ensure compliance? Because I think this is a very important part of any treaty, that there be compliance and verification. So we, we need at least two things. Um, first of all, we want to prevent the large-scale manufacturing of small uh, lethal autonomous weapons, anti-personnel weapons. Um, and this is very analogous to what the Chemical Weapon Convention does. Uh, and there's OPCW, the Office for the Prevention of Chemical Warfare, um, actually uh, works directly with all the member states to, uh, to help them put in place the measures, including accounting for materials and knowing your customer uh, and all that kind of thing, so that uh, large-scale manufacturing cannot take place. The second thing you need is to make sure that weapons that are not banned cannot be easily converted into banned weapons. So, for example, a human piloted drone, uh, let's say a quadcopter or some other device that is currently piloted by a human being, um, we want to avoid the possibility that that can easily and instantly be converted into a fully autonomous weapon simply by changing the software or even just, uh, you know, pressing a key on the keyboard to, you know, reset a flag in the software of thousands of weapons and then have them operate autonomously. So it has to be that there's no software conversion from human piloted to fully autonomous. And one way to achieve that is actually to separate physically the onboard weapon from the onboard computation. So the weapon can only be triggered by a remote control signal coming from the human operator and cannot be physically triggered by any onboard computing system. Uh, so if you do that, then, um, then you can't convert it by software into a fully autonomous weapon. You can also require that for every human piloted weapon, there be a corresponding uh, human pilot station. Um, and so this is a common uh, technique in arms control agreements. For example, the number of missiles and the number of missile carriers have to match up uh, and so on. So I think there are methods we can use to, uh, to build up confidence in, uh, and compliance, and I think this would be a very important thing for nation states to be discussing. But so far, as far as I know, there have been no such discussions uh, taking place in Geneva. So with that, I will stop and uh, happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, it was uh, really interesting and useful. Uh, so I remind uh, that you can ask your questions in comments. I have first question. Uh, so, uh, to date, neither side uh, has used uh, lethal autonomous weapons in Ukraine. Is there any prospect that we will see such examples on the battlefield in the nearest future? Uh, so, that's that's the obvious question and the, the most important question, I think. Um, I think there are pressures that are leading towards this um, because the um, the one most important difference between a human operated weapon and a fully autonomous weapon from a practical point of view is that human operated weapons need radio link. And if you can use electronic warfare to jam that link to prevent communication with the human operator, then you can render the weapon ineffective. Whereas a fully autonomous weapon does not need to communicate. And so um, it can fly around and find its targets. And I think we're seeing this happening incrementally. So my understanding is, for example, that the shaheds that the Russians are using are communicating less and less. Um, they're basically 
operating more as a cruise missile um, rather than a remotely piloted weapon. So a cruise missile is a weapon whose target is fixed in advance. So you specify the particular GPS coordinate and then the cruise missile flies there. It may avoid um, threats. It may change the route that it takes depending on something it perceives, but its target is always in a fixed location. And usually, you know, when the US uses cruise missiles, there's a whole bunch of lawyers who have to agree that that target is a valid military target before the cruise missile gets launched. I don't think the Russians are doing that, um, but uh, they're only using very occasional target updates um, that are communicated to, to the missile uh, during flight. Um, and that's because those any one of those communications gives away the location of the missiles. It you know, gives away the fact that the attack is happening. Um, it opens up the missiles to being shot down uh, and so on, and it makes it makes them vulnerable to jamming. Um, so I think this will tend to lead to uh, making the systems more and more autonomous. I think the on the Ukrainian side, the weapons that are used uh, include small fixed wing and also quadcopters that have been adapted to carry uh, grenades and other explosive devices. Um, and they're operated by human pilots. Um, they might fly above a trench system um, and drop weapons into the trench. They can also be used for uh, improving the accuracy of artillery. So they can see, you know, the human operator can see where the artillery is landing and then can, you know, call back the signal to adjust uh, the artillery to, to be more accurate. So, so interestingly, even though the idea of a remotely operated weapon is that you can function from a safe distance, right? And, and this is why the US uses remotely operated weapons is because people can sit in, in the US and kill people in Pakistan. Right, with no risk to themselves, no risk of, you know, American soldiers coming back in body bags, which is, you know, every president's political nightmare. Um, but when you have two sides that are using these weapons, you end up with a higher casualty rate because they are so effective, right? I mean, that the whole point of those weapons is they're really effective at killing people. Um, but if both sides have those weapons, then both sides are suffering high rates of casualties. Um, and so it sort of has the opposite effect in terms of protecting soldiers um, on the battlefield, because the, now I think, you know, the reports I'm reading suggest that trenches are considered inadequate and people are moving to underground bunkers uh, that can't be seen from above um, as a way of protecting soldiers. So it's, it's I don't think it's a, it's, I don't think it's a net positive uh, in terms of the conduct of warfare. Okay. Um, what about uh, uh, what about air defense systems? Uh, can they be autonomous? And uh, like, what do you think about uh, using of such technologies? Yeah. So, so defensive systems, particularly anti-missile systems, are, are already autonomous on ships, um, and there are also um, systems on tanks that autonomously shoot down incoming mortar bombs and, and other anti-tank missiles. Um, but those, those would not be banned because they're not lethal, right? They shoot down missiles, they don't, they don't kill people. Um, so that would be fine. And I think that, that will continue. There's, you know, and there are lots of, you know, somewhat expensive uh, air defense systems that, that operate in this way. Okay, and what do you think about other autonomous uh, AI technologies that could be used in times of war? Uh, for example, the mining robots. Uh, should efforts be made to develop such tools? Uh, Demining robots are uh, pretty widely used um, by, uh, I'm not sure whether the, 
Ukraine is using them, but I know that um, they're available to US forces. Um, and again, that they would not be banned because they're not lethal. Um, and that's that's clearly a sensible way to clear a minefield uh, rather than sending in a person with a shovel um, is actually to, to use a robot that's disposable. Um, you know, they're expensive, right? I think uh, if, if you end up using up uh, a few hundred robots to clear a minefield, that's that's a very expensive way to do it. Um, well, there are other it other demise uh, places less right? than human life. And yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, but in comparing to other demining devices that are not robots, right? So there's a a truck that has a huge metal, uh, basically a big metal blanket that it throws on the ground, and that causes the mines to explode. Um, and you, you know, you lose a few pieces of metal from the blanket; those can be replaced very quickly, um, and then you just keep doing that. That's that's a pretty effective demining technique. Um, it doesn't involve robots. It's a lot cheaper. Um, so we'll see. I, I, I'm sure that all these technologies will become more efficient, more survivable, um, more robust, and a lot cheaper over time. Okay. Uh, should AI be applied uh, in war, uh, not on the battlefield, but on a higher level? So, for example, I'm talking about uh, simulation uh, and developing scenarios for military campaigns. Uh, well, it already is, and I, I don't see uh, I don't see any moral or practical objection to doing that. Um, I think if, if any country has an obligation to defend itself as effectively, efficiently as it can subject to the laws of war and reasonable moral constraint. Um, and so I don't, I don't see an objection to doing that. Um, I'm actually a little surprised by how slowly that technology has progressed. Um, I have, you know, for example, you might think simulation, it's such an obvious use, right? We can we can build giant simulations with you know hundreds of thousands of soldiers and thousands of aircraft and tanks and make it very, I mean, we all, well, I don't know, my kids will play video games with, with all this kind of stuff in, and it's quite realistic. Um, and uh, you, know, you would think that militaries would be using this, but um, I keep asking them about it, particularly not just to develop tactics and so on, but to develop the technology of situation assessment. Because the nice thing about a simulation is you have access to ground truth. So you can judge the effectiveness. Well, what if we had you know, this type of satellite data? What if we had you know, these kinds of sensors placed on the battlefield? What if we did this? What if we did that? You can simulate different types of sensor access and measure how effective it is against ground truth. Because in a simulation, you have the ground truth. Um, and I've been talking to Defense Department people about this for 25 years or so. And they they tell me that, no, the way we do it is called BOGSAT. I'll put that in the chat, right? B-O-G-S-A-T, right? Which stands for bunch of guys sitting around the table. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about that's how that's how they do military simulations. Yeah. A bunch of guys sitting around the table. So oh, some more so. complicated questions. Um, I like uh, all Ukrainians expect Ukraine to win in the Russian war as quickly as possible, and with the least losses. Uh, it's obvious that uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, due to its scale, can uh, become a testing ground for testing uh, the most innovative weapons, including those based on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, does such a scenario have positive aspects in terms of uh, possibility of bringing closer the Ukrainian victory? I mean, that I mean, it's I think, obvious yeah, uh, right. that uh, the negative aspects of uh, trying uh, innovative weapons in battlefields are obvious. Are there any positive 
aspects. So I think for some of the technology, I think reconnaissance, uh, sure. Um, you know, defense, defensive technologies, anti-missile, air defense, et cetera, all of that, absolutely fine. Um, you know, I think when you get into um, anti-personnel, right, it, there's no question that lethal autonomous weapons against soldiers in the field can be incredibly effective, right? I mean, that's kind of what that video was intended to show um, was that, you know, whether you're in the field or in buildings, uh, you know, essentially human beings will not survive on the battlefield. Um, they, they would need substantial protection. They need to be underground or heavy armor, you know, with, uh, you know, anti-missile or anti-drone devices to protect them. Um, so if one side does develop and deploy those kinds of weapons, I think it would be a substantial uh, military advantage. There's no doubt about it. And I think you're starting to see that, you know, when, when you look at what Russia is doing with the Shaheds, it's waiting until it has 100 or 150 missiles, and then it's launching them all simultaneously because that swarm makes it possible to overcome the air defenses and you know still 20 or 30 will get through and cause enormous amounts of damage um so i i can totally understand why ukraine might want to develop and deploy these kinds of weapons i i think you know i've read reports about um lot you know ukraine preparing large numbers of human piloted uh, quadcopter weapons as, as part of you know this coming offensive that everyone's expecting. Um, but if jamming makes that ineffective, I can see why Ukraine might want to move towards fully autonomous weapons. But at the same time, Ukraine also has to be prepared that Russia would then start using the autonomous weapons against Ukrainian civilians. So you mean that it can be a reason for Russia to use uh, autonomous weapons also? Because they already use like uh, their all possible weapons they have to civilian uh, civilians and uh, against civilian infrastructure. Yeah, well, they. I don't know the state of. Russian lethal autonomous weapons. I know that uh, Kalashnikov Corporation claims to have abilities to produce lethal autonomous weapons, including a ground uh, a ground vehicle, like a, a small tank uh, mm -hmm. that's maybe two meters long and carries heavy weapons and so on, but then operates autonomously. But I've not seen any successful demonstrations. So we really don't know. I mean, they they do have fairly advanced uh, human piloted weapons. Um, I forget the names of those weapons right now, but there's um, there are several that are in use in Ukraine already. Um, so it would not surprise me if they are working hard on uh, figuring out how to make those autonomous, particularly as Ukraine is developing electronic countermeasures. Okay, so, another complicated question. Uh, uh, we already have negative experience with Budapest Memorandum. Uh, when Ukraine uh, got rid of nuclear weapons uh, in exchange for the protection that was promised, uh, uh, including uh, uh, protection by Russia. And now we see uh, how instead of protecting Russia, they bomb civilian targets with uh, missiles that Ukraine gave them in late. 90s. So uh, the question is, how effective is international regulation of uh, AI when it comes to war? Um, so that's a good question. And that's sort of what I addressed towards the end in terms of compliance. And I, I completely agree that compliance is necessary. And um, 
it's partly a technological problem of how do you detect uh, large attempts at large scale manufacturing uh, of these weapons, which is the main issue that we're concerned about. Um, and I, I believe that's possible. And I think the Chemical Weapons Convention, you know, our experience with that suggests that it can be effective. Um, I totally understand the, the Budapest Agreement, but the Budapest Agreement wasn't, wasn't a global ban on a particular class of weapons. It was you know, a non-aggression agreement um, and they just either never intended to honor it or they changed their minds about uh, honoring the agreement. Um, but the global bans on weapons um, have mostly been effective despite, you know, occasional violations. Um, so not just biological and chemical, but, you know, cluster munitions, landmines, so even though the US and Russia haven't ratified the landmine treaty, the number of landmines that exist in the world has been they've almost completely been eliminated. Um, there's, as far as I know, only one manufacturer left in, in the West, uh, which is in South Korea. Um, and so, and, and the United States is only using landmines that self-extinguish after six hours. Uh, so, I, so I think our, our record on global bans on weapon categories has been uh has been pretty good not perfect but pretty good and i i think we would be able to detect attempts to to violate the treaty on a large scale okay uh so the next question i will quote uh kai Fuli, who says that uh, ai is uh, the third revolution in warfare now, after gun power and nuclear weapons, what do you think about it? I think it's possibly true. Uh, it's not true yet. Um, and it's actually interesting why it's not true yet. Um, because, as I said, you know, most of the technology was available ten more than 10 years ago um, that you would need. And I think it actually, it's, it's hesitation on the part of the major new, major military powers. They could do a Manhattan Project. So, you know, the Manhattan Project was much more difficult. It built the first nuclear weapon in two years, starting from a state where we didn't even know what a nuclear weapon was, right? We knew that we could make a big bang somehow, but we had no idea how to make a big bang. Um, and uh, so they had to do all the physics and all the engineering and figure out how to enrich uranium. And you know they used 4% of all the electricity in the United States. They built a massive factory in the middle of the desert. Um, and they did all of that in two years. Uh, so if we put in that type of effort into fully autonomous weapons, I think we could, you know, we could be filled, fielding on the order of billions of weapons. Um, and yet none of that has happened. And I think it's because the nation states are actually uncertain. They're hesitant to move ahead with this because they perceive that there are real risks to international stability. Okay, uh, so now we are observing uh, discussions uh, about generative AI. Um, it can be also used in warfare, for example, for spreading uh, disinformation, misinformation. Uh, should it be regulated? And uh, to continue that question, uh, also you uh, signed uh, that open letter for uh, post uh, um, research and generative uh, models. Can you talk a bit about that and why uh, you think it should be paused? Um yeah, sure. So the letter specifically asked for a pause, not on research and development, but on building and releasing larger models than or more powerful models than GPT-4, which is the most recent system from OpenAI. Um, so 
very quickly, right? What is what is a large language model? It's a it's a system for predicting the next word uh, given a sequence of words. So if I say happy, you might think the next word should be birthday, right? But not underneath, right? We don't go around saying happy underneath, we, but we do say happy birthday. So birthday is a good prediction. Um, so GPT-4 predicts the next word given the previous 32,000 words in a sequence, not just one word like happy, but 32,000 words of context. Um, it has about a trillion parameters. Uh, it starts out as a blank slate, knows nothing at all, and you make about a billion trillion small random permutations to those parameters, um, trying to get it to become better at predicting the next word, given about 20 or 30 trillion words of training text, which is roughly equivalent to all the books that the human race has ever written. So, um, so these systems are pretty powerful and capable. Um, Microsoft, for example, which spent six months evaluating GPT-4, claims that it exhibits sparks of artificial general intelligence. And artificial general intelligence means AI systems that are across the board more capable of human beings. Um, and many people who've worked with GPT-4 and even ChatGPT, the previous version, uh, find that it's capable of doing things that in many, many, many areas that they themselves could not do. So these are pretty powerful systems. We have no idea how they work. Because it's a trillion parameters, you make a billion trillion perturbations to those parameters, and then you hope for the best, right? We have no idea what's going on inside. Um, I asked Microsoft, have these systems developed their own internal goals? And if so, what are they? And they said, we have no idea. So uh, that's my reason for signing the letter, is that I don't think we should be deploying systems that show sparks of artificial general intelligence uh, that may or may not be pursuing their own internal goals, and we have no idea how they work. So I think the right answer is we develop regulations for criteria that systems should meet before they can be released. And um, it's up to the companies to figure out how to make sure that their systems meet those criteria. And China has already done that. Their regulations require that systems should not output false information. Um, but if you know anything about large language models, they output false information all the time. And there's nothing you can do to stop them because because we don't know how they work. We don't know why they output false information, right. um, but they just do it all the time. And so effectively, China is banning large language models. Again, okay, coming back to uh, uh, disinformation and misinformation, uh, like Rafa is uh, famous for using uh, bots and uh, trolls in yep. social media. And with uh, generative language models, you can uh, uh, develop uh, like complete fake profiles with generated photos, with generated history and content, and with generated uh, misinformation messages. How dangerous yep. is it? Yeah, I think it's pretty dangerous. In fact, I mean, I'm already seeing these on LinkedIn. Um, I'm often getting, you know, friend requests from fictional people on LinkedIn who have pictures, CV, they start talking to you. And pretty quickly you realize they're not real. Uh, you know, you can ask some questions about their background and they have no idea what you're talking about. So it's, <laughs> they're not real at all. Um, they're usually pictures of attractive young women as well, because I guess they figure that works better. Um, yeah, so I think it's a huge problem, um, not just developing fake profiles, but enabling the system. So for example, I could, I could, Ask GPT-4, okay, this guy, Dmitry Chumachenko, find out everything that we know about him from social media, anything he's written, uh, who his friends are, who his family is, and then write a letter to Dmitry that will convince him to 
you know, to support Russia in the war. And that letter will come from a close relative or a friend, right? And we can do that to 20 million people individually in the space of an afternoon. And, you know, it only has to work a few percent of the time to be uh, an incredibly powerful political tool. Um, you know, if you do that in, you know, elections in the United States, uh, you could you could swing the election one way or the other because it's usually pretty close. Um, and, uh, you know, interestingly, uh, California has a law banning that. So it's in California, it's against the law to impersonate a human being for the purpose of convincing a person to vote in an election. But not for any other purpose. So any other purpose is still, it's still okay uh, to produce disinformation. So it's, uh, I think, really has to be regulated uh, and that has to happen soon. The European Union AI Act will ban that type of use, but uh, in the US and most other countries, it's still legal. Okay, we'll see. Uh, so our time is running out. Uh, because of uh, most of our audience is from academia, my, my last uh, short question is about education. Uh, how do you think generative models uh, will affect the global education systems? Uh, interesting question. I think um, students will, well, students already are misusing them. Uh, and that presents a problem. I think we may move much more towards face-to-face -to -face examination, uh, what we call viva voce in, uh, in the English education system. So um but as a tool for teaching i think they can be incredibly powerful that's not really happening yet um because i think most of the money is in advertising uh and other kinds of tools like that but education is is an area that has such enormous potential for ai to be useful because it can it can adjust to the individual pupil um, and, uh, and each child can learn at their own pace in their own style. Um, and that can be incredibly beneficial. Um, so I'm hoping that governments will encourage the development of those types of systems. You know, we would still want teachers. In fact, you know, if, if a teacher could using AI, you know, teach at twice the normal rate, Right, or with twice the effectiveness that, in, that you would get in a normal classroom, I think we would be willing to employ more teachers rather than fewer teachers um, because they would be delivering some, you know, much higher quality of education uh, to the students. And I think we would like that. So, okay. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, today we talked with Professor Stuart Russell from the University of California, Berkeley. Thanks a lot for your time and your experience. It was really useful. And thanks to our audience uh, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much and good luck with everything that you're facing. <laughs>